Our last speaker of the, of the conference is uh, Noam Galya Moshkovitz, who is a member of Kibbutz Pelach and married with three children, a history teacher and ninth grade educator in the Tefen Experimental School. She has a bachelor's degree in Jewish history from the University of Haifa, a teaching certificate in history from the Oranim College, and a master's degree from the Ruderman Program for American Jewish Studies at the University of Haifa. Her thesis is on the topic of Jewish American women in the joint organization between the, war, uh, between the years 1933 and 45. She is working under the supervision of Professor Goral uh, Roy and Dr. Esther uh, Carmel Hakim. She will be speaking on the topic of From the Family Arena to the Public Sphere, Women's Activities in Aid Organizations During Wartime and as Enablers of Social Mobility. So, um, hi, my name is Noma Gila Moskova. It's a really move to be here. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I am uh, from the younger generation. I just finished my thesis, really. So, for me, it's actually quite a first trial. So, any criticism will be very appreciated. It's, quite, it's my baptism by fire here. So, I, the, you mentioned so much, especially during the first panel, you talked about why they didn't focus on Helen Benata and they focused on the Northern Jewry. And I think there's also the fact of the fact that she was a woman and uh, that's what I focused on in my research. Um, absence of women from stage of history, though they were part of so many historical events. In addition, we'll try to give some kind of lateral out view, overview of Jewish women in organizations of North America and United States. That's the topic I researched, and I think a lot of um, interfaces between my topic about women that were um, active in volunteering organizations in uh, America, Mandarli and uh, Benatar. I didn't know about Mandarli. It was very interesting, really. So, um, this is from the family circle to the public arena, um, social mobility facilitation uh, during the wartime. I would like to show you how various volunteer organizations aided women in exiting the household where in majority society did support that the women will stay at home with the family, how this organization allowed them to step out into the public arena, how during the wartime they managed to leave even further into different arenas, different front lines where there were no place for women before. We'll give a little bit of a short background of the role of the 13 and 14 United States, and then I'll delve into the joint organization. In 1945. So, as I said, women, the American society, according to the research in the 30s and the 40s, is still embedded significantly on family values, very conservative society, and there is a very clear separation at home and in the market, work market, women expected to stay at home and take care of the family and if they're going for work. There's certain professions for women and men, and it's very segregated, it's very separate. It's very important to emphasize that during the 30s, already women had the right to vote, and political rights. But America in depth of it within the Great Depression, so majority of women are not promoting their political situation, but they try to survive economically. And that's what they're busy with. They're busy with that. Yep. The Jewish women, the American Jewish women, again, carrying this whole weight on their shoulders and the very fact that the Jewish women that are living in the society where they're still very different components of anti-Semitism from the external society and the Jewish women, they're also limited by different traditions of Jewish society in which they grew up. Many of those women that we'll be talking about, those women are first or second generation of immigrants, so they're handling as well the challenges of integration to American society. They carry this whole very significant baggage on their shoulders. One of the most important things we know about the Jewish women in those years is they saw in education as a very important bridge into American society and that's the reason that so many women graduated from high school, going to colleges and universities. And it's an important highlight as far as they're concerned and if they work. 
the most of until they get married and they, they will take a step back. In the end of the day, the American women as well and the Jewish American no, you women as well, the main mission that they have as society cares is to get married and to raise a family. And those who break this glass ceiling consider to be extraordinary women that work, they worked until they got married or some kind of a side job in the higher stratus of society. She's a high self woman and then the law she also works at home and she also has some kind of side job in order to enforce the economical situation of the family in the lower stratus of the society this burden is on their shoulders and um Also, as we can see, the female organization that started to accelerate from the end of the 19th century. American women, especially well-established women, create female women organizations designated to work in the society a little bit outside of their households. They cannot join as Jewish women to the Christian organization. That's why we have the Jewish National Council of Women in 1903 and later on other Jewish women organizations that were created which was possible within this American conservatism as an expansion of their role at home because they use on philanthropy and the needy education, children and welfare. And usually it's done with women of um, bourgeois and uh, middle class that have a home and they have their own children and they have also women that work in their homes in order to allow them to step outside and to work outside. They focus on female topics and very gradually this is expanding and becoming more and more prominent. Indeed, through this particular process, they start to step out from their home inward environment to the public arena. I would like to focus on two main organizations, which is one, the National Council of Jewish Women in 1893 and Hadassah Organization in 1912. Those two organizations are established, first of all, on women from a high socioeconomical strata. Later on, they expanded. They work mostly in the female fields, education, welfare, health, uh, refugees, immigrants. And a very interesting um, aspect that they are growing and becoming more established from local and small organizations and becoming large and national that have already very significant infrastructure organizations and women run it. Different from other organizations where they don't have a footstep in those places, they are active in all the managerial uh, aspects of organization, treasury, Um, fundraising and management and etc. So within this arena of women organization, they'll manage to reach roles that cannot reach in the general society because they actually prevented from doing so. They accumulate political and economical experience of management. Two women that presented here, Henrietta Sol, that I don't have to expand, obviously, she's well known in Israel and in fact, she reached amazing achievements um, in her status in the Zionist movement and Cecilia Rozovsky. And if you're familiar with the American Jewry, it's a very significant uh, figure that was specialized in work with the immigrants and later on led a lot of work with the American Jewry with refugees that arrived from Germany and Austria to the United States. So in women organizations, they go extra mile and they manage to specialize in their own fields, which is a very important point. Yes. During the wartime, So we can see some kind of emergency that prepares the ground for a temporary change for women. The country asks them to step out of the comfort zone and to join the national effort and women. Millions of them live home with enthusiasm. You're familiar with this poster, this icon of Rosa Tirivita. Uh, women that go to work in the war industry replace the men at the big factory. They step outside. They experience a new type of employment, different wages, and uh, see it as an opportunity. At the same time, hundreds of thousands of women join the military at the auxiliary roles. They are not members, they are auxiliary forces for the <coughs> combatant troops. But thousands and hundreds of thousands of women want to participate. They're limited for very particular roles of nurses of entertainment of soldiers, of clerkships, but they serve in the military and they step outside, they um, break the borders of their housebound existence. This is the Second World War, okay? In the United States in 1941 until 1945. 
It's very important to mention that the image is that during that period of time, some kind of revolution in the women's status happened. It was a very temporary revolution in the society can wait to women the message you hear until it ends you need to allow the man to go back home after the war to their traditional role and then you will stepping back to your household to the kitchen and that's what actually happens and the it's actually reached the 60s the Jewish women participate in this effort significantly which is their concern for the Jews in occupied Europe some of the Hamel is them and they find a very solid ground in expressing their political protest towards the American government that chooses not to get involved most of the time, to use the American women organization in order to work for their brothers, aid to refugees, orphans, and immigrants, and, and part of the consumer process that American Jews uh, led towards the boycotting Jew Ameri sorry, German um, produce and the Jewish Congress of uh, women division leader, they stand at the entry to the stores, they demonstrate and they were caught as a female field consumption and they find the different ways to use women organization to protest and express their opinions. And the central organization that I researched is the joint. The joint was created in 1914, two months after the First World War began. It was three different um, voluntarily aid organizations in order to help their brothers in Palestine and in Europe during the war. The organization tried to do its best, and it's an emergency organization after the war. They understood that it have to become a permanent organization because the situation of the Jews is even worse. So the purpose of this organization was to rehabilitate the Jewish communities all over the world, and in fact supports such an attempt until this very day. And uh, it's important to mention, and it has been mentioned here in the beginning, that uh, joint uh, included women from the very beginning. It wasn't equal to men, not in the same numbers, not the same positions, but we see them as partners and involved from the very beginning in now uh, different positions. And I wanted to look in my thesis whether they managed to break through from a um, gender limitations perspective or whether they were sent to the back benches of the society when the research women is the joint during those years. I saw three different groups, very diverse one of women, that one can see that work in Jordan from 33 until 45. As you can see, the first group is the female feminine professions. I will use Henrietta Krinsky Buchmann as an example. Buchmann is, uh, she was born in 1984. She was born in Russia. She immigrated to the United States. She grew up in uh, New York and uh, all of family. I interviewed her granddaughter. She grew up as a family that resisted uh, female education. She fought. She grew graduated from high school, college, university, she studied social work, and she was her own woman, and she was very dedicated to her work. Started to work in 1934 in the joint as a secretary, regardless of her education, she did that. She got married when she was 30, and she only had one daughter, but she was working for 30 years in the joint as the secretary. Later on, she was a secretary of the committee, of the culture committee, the culture of the Eastern Poland, or Eastern Europe and Poland. She was in touch with dozens and hundreds of various cultural, educational, and religious institutes all over Poland and Europe. She's in touch with them. She helps them during the war as well. You can see her name in the protocols of various committees, of various discussions. She is present. She's there. She does not run the meetings. You cannot see her at the senior ranks, but she's present. I will read from the words of Farwell that were read to her in December 1962 when, when there was a meeting of the joint. Generator Buchmann brought to her work as intellectual sympathy and dedication and creativity and social imagination. Part of the hardest problems that she handled as a committee because of her tremendous effort received a fruitful and quick solution. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. We found her services very satisfactory. So basically, we can see that she is there, she is part of it, but she is still behind the scenes. And this is quite in common with her, with other women. And they're not even their photographs. They disappeared between the pages of history. What is really in common to this group, they were daughters of immigrants. They came from um, a low economical uh, stratus. They acquired insignificant professions as typists and secretaries, and they joined the work market as fast as possible. And they were independent. Uh, and they were working there for dozens of years in the joint until retirement, which is not the typical for most of the women. But they are, in fact, behind the 
scenes, they are significant. They seen when you look for them within the joint archives. You can actually see that they entwine during all the meetings and committees, but again, they're not at the front. They're not at the front line of decision making. This is the first group. The second group of women is completely different. This is a different socioeconomical strata. The women are the representative positions. Palina Berwald Folk will be representing them. She's daughter of Folk Berwald, who was one of the founders of Joint. Uh, she comes from a very privileged background, rich family, Jews from Germany. That, in fact, she grew up in a very affluent family and a traditional women that um, receive uh, good education and go and work in philanthropic organizations as volunteers. She was born in 1910. She graduated college and she worked with refugees in the United States and she planned to work social work, but she delayed the studies in the end. She got married and she gave up her studies and she describes her connection to the joint. In spring of 1933, there was a very important meeting in the house of my father, what is happening in Germany. They talked about fundraising. Chana B. Weiss, who was the fundraiser of the joint, asked me, whether young people of my age that currently graduate from college will be interesting to step in and to help the German youngsters that can not study in the colleges. And I said, of course. A year later, instead of going to study social work in the university, I joined the joint and I began to create the youth division of the joint. So we can actually see here a young girl with a favorable uh, family background that opened a door for her, which wouldn't be provided to her if she wouldn't be connected to this milieu. And she's in fact extraordinary, very talented young lady. And she leads the establishment of the youth division of the joint. She walks around. She is traveling around the United States. She presents. She went to Germany in 1934. She met with youth and students. She returned from there, full with impressions to raise money for them. And you can see her addressing the crowds in the United States, involved in different teams, committees, projects, a very prominent uh, figure of that period of time. But indeed, um, she comes there based on the connection that she has from her economical and family background to those leaders, the men of the joint. She's part of a very significant group of women, all of them from very affluent families, very well-established families in the Jewish community. They all come from their higher stratas, all got married very young. They had children and they went to do philanthropy, volunteering in different organizations without higher education, the members of the boards, managers and committees and etc. They use their name, their money in order to promote topics that are important for them. But within this existing structure of women of their status, what is possible, and no groundbreaking behavior, and they don't have to break through. They don't have to give up the family or the marriage because they have the money to maintain that using other women. Well, this is the second group. They invite it to the boards of direction, directors. They bring the name, their family, their well, to the board of directors. Women as professions, very diverse group of women. I will show it through Gertrude Pinsky. Pinsky was, she was born as well in Russia. She was graduated from the States with her family. And she graduated from college and university. She studied social work and law. She was a very educated young lady. And she studied as a social worker in the Jewish welfare agency in Cincinnati. And then she was positioned as a field worker in the Jewish Women Council. She accumulated significant experience of working as a social worker with immigrants. And this is how the joint asked her to come in and to go as an emissary to South America. Uh, women emissaries is very extraordinary in that period of time. Uh, women that were in the military as well and were sent overseas were very limited in their ability to actually step outside of the basis and to mix in in the society. They were very limited and restricted. They kept them very safe said they will not break some kind of borders. And she was sent to South America, to Uruguay, where she spent a few months and she worked with the community, with the refugees. And in fact, we can see there how she breaks through all the definitions. She's not just a social worker. She is also a liaison of the journey. She's a representative. She's a fundraiser. She does local politics. She handles so many difficulties and challenges. And later on, she goes for around the whole South America between different communities. And in the end of the war, she's been positioned in Netherlands as a director of the journey. She starts to work in rehabilitation of the survivors of the Holocaust to go back to Netherlands. She's well appreciated. And uh, when she was killed in 1946, and the plane crash uh, on the way to the conference. Mm -hmm. 
I will read, it was a memorial a um, year later on, there was a conference dedicated to her memory. A few things, the eulogies were read, the young Jewish woman that never concerned to walk around South America on her own, regardless of less of comfort and fear, she went to all of the communities to help them in rehabilitation and welfare programs. She was um, there when she was called to the um, rehabilitation of the Jewry of um, Europe. There was no difference between the heroism she needed to comply with the danger she was facing and the endless number of youth that were willing to sacrifice themselves fighting for the humanity. As many of them, she was selected to create this final sacrifice. We understand this very special place that she uh, occupies. There are two other women that are researched. Uh, uh, Mark, Mrs. Margulis is very famous in the joint, and Rosa Rabinov, the wine voyeurs for, to Cuba and Shanghai. In addition, we can see another group of women that arrive with the profession and they arrive into the joint as just a station on the way. They build their career before, as um, we have here, Rebecca horowitz Ryer. she is a suffragist and she is a journalist. She goes to Africa and she travels. Zelda Bokin, she is a writer and author. She has a PR agency and Eric Levenstein, she really, she deserves a separate conference. So when you have a time and um, they are women of outstanding capability, their identity was their profession, women that most of them gave up on the regular route of family and children, and if they did marry, there was very uh, divorce. Some of them did not marry, or they left their husband and traveled um, for their missions. Majority of them didn't have children, so they give up this thing, and they profess with their identity, and they work, and they break through. All of them were daughters of uh, immigrants from low class. They had the professional education. One can see the way they conduct themselves, they came with confidence and they're being treated differently. They negotiate uh, their wages and their conditions, they dare to criticize the way things are done. They actually have a say, because they came with some kind of very solid ground of confidence. So I was aspiring toward the end. And there was a bit of a comparison. When you compare those different groups, I've tried to see whether within joint, as an organization, women could break the glass ceiling or whether they stand to the back lines. I think there are just a few different types of breakthrough. And later on, we'll talk about social mobility. So first of all, the upper class maintained the existing social structure. Women of the first group, feminine professions, though they do work for all those years, but they have feminine profession, what is allowed, they do not break through, okay, stay in the back, they do stay in the back, they don't require to be at the front, though some of them do deserve that. And uh, they do maintain their social status. At the same time, women from the highest strata, representative positions, they work as they usually do in the high class positions. They do absolutely nothing extraordinary for their period of time. But we do see that women of the higher class using the connections of the family manage to make a difference, to impact, to create changes, to move it forward. They're aware of the fact that they're women. And they're climbing up the ladder and they see that they're rich and they're right. That's for them it's important that women do those things and not a man. And they managed to do that in my eyes because they had some kind of help at home. They couldn't have to fight. They didn't have to fight to break through this ceiling of marriage and family. They don't have to battle that. So it was okay for them. So places where women really broke through was where they had to give up the marriage or family and to exceed the dictation of the society and then could actually outline the new path. Indeed, 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 we do see an outstanding group of third group of women with a profession that managed to reach amazing achievements to break through the glass ceiling of the limitations, the profession of very important part, <clears throat> they write, and they look for the place of impact, they look for significance, they want to partake in the historical events in a significant manner, and that's why they stay in the joint when it's not enough, they move forward, many of them. And uh, we see this group, and we see this group of women that were part of, um, for example, emissary missions that was quite a groundbreaking change. They did things that were not accepted for women then, and my thought, my conclusion is that leaving United States from this supervision of your society from raised greenhouse to the areas of refugees chaos where there was no one who could supervise you and they could do whatever they wanted and they show their high capabilities and their skills and they receive a lot of acolytes 
for the actions. So as a summary, do we have here, in fact, social mobility? Yes, I think so, under certain circumstances that I will present later on. The um, organizations of philanthropy allowed women a significant social mobility, and we saw in um, those organizations, though they are quite limited by the very fact that the women organizations, they managed to break through and they go into the fields of action that are completely new, the rich senior positions, and we had the sold as an evidence that became, in fact, a leading figure after all of the dispute in Israel, who will be managing the uh, children of Tehran operation, she makes the decisions there. She manages the whole thing. And decide that the women organization didn't leave the United States during the war. They didn't send NYAs into Europe and the world, and the joint did it. So in this sense, a woman that works in the joint could get a significant platform of actually breaking through and to reach the front lines where actually history was made and significant um, endeavor took place. Another important point is that femi feminine profession until then of social work became vital during the war because the Jews of the United States, the only thing they could actually do was to help the refugees and those who worked with the refugees were the social workers. And suddenly this profession actually became prestigious and um, made was at high demand at the front. And those women, Gertrude Pinsky and Rosa Rabinov, the social workers, three of them are sent all over the world to work with the refugees. And that was the um, springboard from this American uh, protected hub, and this is where they managed to actually bring um, to remain unsupervised, where there was care, so no one actually supervised and told them, okay, those are the borders, stay in, you can't do whatever you want to do. And I think more expanded way, a volunteering organization, nothing that it's institutionalized of the government or leadership, and um, within there's more room for movement of exceeding the borders and not paying a high social price for it. Just to wrap it up, um, Aaron Margulis quote, if I'd been a man, I would have joined the Navy, seen the world, but since I'm a woman, I joined the DC. So thank you so much. I would like to thank the panel for their enlightening papers. The contributions of this panel have certainly broadened our view of the work of Elaine Benatar. We have a general understanding of the sociological background of women working in philanthropic and voluntary associations before and during World War II, how the modern and efficient approach of, her, of Benatar's husband's reforms assisted her in her work with refugees, and the importance of, Bill, of Bilha ben, uh, Benderli's Zionist work and connections to philanthropic and voluntary organizations. Thank you. <laughs>